Good morning, church family. I'd invite you to open with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible, it will be on the screen. You can also open up your Christ Fellowship app and click on the In Search for a King logo, and you can get a link to the scripture passage there. We're going to look at all of chapter 16 this morning. I'm going to read the first 13 verses for us as we begin. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peacefully, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to look invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he, took, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day Ford. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is God's word. At the very end of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Indiana has finally made it to the place of the Holy Grail. And he meets that old knight that's been there for like a thousand years. And the knight tells him, the Grail is here, And if you choose the wrong one, it will cost you your life. But if you choose the right one, it will give you everlasting life. And out before him, right, are dozens and dozens of potential holy grails. And then the bad guy comes in as well, right? He's on Indiana's coattails. And he decides he's going to go after the grail first. And so he has his assistant pick the most glittering, shining grail that you could find out of all of the objects there. And he looks at it and he says, it's more beautiful than I could imagine. Surely this is the cup of the king of kings. Shortly after drinking it, we have that weird way people die in the Indiana Jones movies, you know, kind of gross and weird, and he ages really quickly, and he's no more. And then Indiana goes looking, And he finds a really common cup. And he goes, that's the cup of a carpenter. And he picks that one. And the knight says, you have chosen wisely. One of our problems as human beings is exactly that scene in Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. We are people obsessed with the outward appearance for the glittering objects and the glittering people that look fancy, that look nice, that look like they will give us great rewards, that only kill us in the end. 1 Samuel 16 provides an amazing contrast for how God chooses his king, 
versus how the people chose their king in 1 Samuel 8. We love to look at the outside. We want something glittering and shining. But in 1 Samuel 16, God looks at the heart. What we're going to see this morning is that God picks his king based upon the heart, not the appearance, and so should we. But this is so opposite for how we normally live our lives that much of this chapter is a surprise for us. Things don't go the way we would orchestrate them. Things don't go the way that we would plan them. It's a bit of a surprise for how God picks. And so as we look at this text this morning, we're going to see two surprises. One is a surprising choice in verses 1 through 13, and two is a surprising path in verses 14 through 23. So let's start with a surprising choice. Samuel is grieving over Saul. He's been rejected as king in the previous chapter, but he's still sad for what's happened. And God essentially tells him, look, it's time for you to get up and go, for I have provided for myself a king. In chapter 8, the people chose for themselves a king, but in chapter 16, God says, I provided for myself a king. And Samuel, who's prophet and Sitting king as Saul knows this might be kind of awkward, so what should I tell King Saul about this? He says, well, tell him the whole truth, but not the whole story. You're going to this town to offer a sacrifice. And so he goes and he invites Jesse to the sacrifice. You may remember a couple Christmases ago, we went through the book of Ruth together and talked about how Ruth paved the way for the king. Well, Jesse is Ruth's grandson And he is bringing his boys with him. And Samuel comes into the city and the town elders start freaking out. In verse four, they start trembling and ask if you come peaceably. It seems that word had gotten out about what Samuel had done to the king of the Amalekites in the previous chapter. Let's just say it wasn't pretty. And so they're wondering, you might be old, but apparently you got game and you can like destroy people. So are you coming to do to us what you did to him? And he says, no, I've I've come peaceably. And so Jesse comes, and as as, uh, Samuel's giving the sacrifice, he starts bringing his sons before him. And Eliab comes, the, the firstborn, the oldest, and it would seem that he was also tall and handsome in appearance. And it's so interesting because Samuel says, surely this is the guy. Now, you may remember, as Saul was described, one of the repeating phrases that she used to describe Saul was he was a head taller than everyone else. He looked like a king. He was tall. He was fit. He he was attractive. And Samuel, even though he's a prophet of the Lord, still hasn't learned his own lesson. These aren't the things that he should be looking at. He shouldn't be looking at the outward appearance, but he can't escape it, right? Because that's part of our human nature. It's something that is deeply embedded with us in our sin. So he says, surely this is the Lord's anointed. And the Lord tells him in verse 7, don't look at the outward appearance. God doesn't look that way. He judges by the heart. So he rejects the firstborn, and then Abinadab comes, and he rejects him, and then Shammah comes, and he rejects him. And seven of his sons come before him, and it looks like they're out of luck. And Samuel just kind of throws out, hey, are these all of your sons? And it's as if he's forgotten about David. He goes, oh, well, I have my youngest, which could also be translated smallest. But notice it says, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. Meaning, (laughs) Samuel, this is not your guy, okay? If my other sons didn't make it, David's certainly not your guy. Behold, he's keeping the sheep. He's like disqualified. For us Christians in the 21st century, shepherd has like a nice feeling, you know? But in this culture at this time, shepherds were lowly people on the bottom rung of the social ladder. There was something special about being a shepherd. But Samuel says, go ahead and give him. And he comes and he's described as ruddy. Uh, That might be translated redhead. So for you gingers, you know, you're welcome. There's a redemption to being ginger. David, King David was as well. Sorry, rule number one of public speaking, never insult your audience. He was ruddy, he had beautiful eyes, and he was handsome. So David's not an ugly person, right? He's a good-looking guy, but on outward appearances, you wouldn't have looked at him and said, that's the king, that's the guy, that's the Lord's anointed. 
So Samuel anoints him with oil. We don't know if David knows what he's being anointed for. But notice the Spirit of the Lord rushes on him. Just like the Spirit of the Lord rushed on the judges to perform their task to save Israel, just like the Spirit of the Lord rushed on Saul when he was anointed king to perform his task. But the big difference here is those were temporary rushings, but this one is from that day forward. The Spirit of the living God comes upon David to empower him to be the king. But everything about David and everything about his selection was a surprising choice. In the list of seven people uh, fitted to be king, he wasn't even on the list. He had to be begged to, oh yeah, go get him in the field. Maybe he could be the one. And doesn't this remind us of Jesus Right, David's appearance, David's surprising choice is similar to what we see in Jesus in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah says that this coming rescuer, this coming king, would have no majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. When Jesus was walking around on earth, there was nothing about him that screamed Messiah, and yet he was. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says that God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. What we have here in 1 Samuel 16 is David is a surprising choice for king. He doesn't fit our worldly qualifications, but he is God's anointed. And David's greater son, Jesus, would be a surprising choice based upon physical appearance, but he was indeed God's anointed. And when you looked at their hearts, David had a heart after God. Jesus had a heart that was gentle and lowly in spirit. But one of our problems is what Samuel does. You and I are so focused on outward appearance You and I are so focused on being impressive and going after people that are impressive that on our own, we will always choose Saul and we will never choose David. That in our sin, we're blinded to the true king. We miss God's anointed because we're focused on the glittering gold object. That's really not gold at all. When I was in college, I I led a college ministry. And uh, if you want to know the worldly way to grow a college ministry, here it is. You find really attractive guys who are single and really attractive girls who are single that also have great personalities and can talk with people. And it would be preferable if they were athletes as well. So you find good looking athletes with great personalities that are single, they they can tell their friends, if you want to meet somebody, come here. There's some great looking people. That's how you grow a college ministry according to the world if you want to do it that way. And so I have to confess, as we were starting this college ministry, after each week would ended, uh, that's what I was looking for. I was like, I need some people that can stick around here that are going to be like, you know, people that other people want to come and see. You know what I'm saying? And so... uh, After one week, this guy came up to me who was not that. We'll just leave it there. He was not that. All of those things, all of those outward impressive things, not that. And so if I'm going to be honest with you, in my heart, I'm thinking, surely this is not the guy. He's kind of tall and lanky, uh, not well-dressed, very socially awkward. And I was thinking, look, if we're going to build this thing, I need some people here that are like, not this. And God forgive me, because over the next couple of years, this guy became our most influential member of this group. This guy was the guy inviting everyone he knew to be a part of this ministry. This guy was the most faithful guy that we had there. He was the best evangelist that we had there because he didn't care about what people thought about him. He would just share Jesus with other people. I learned in that moment, God forgive me, because the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And the application of this chapter, of this section, isn't mainly, hey, if you're not good looking, at least you have a good heart. 
Maybe that's true. The application from this chapter really is, regardless of how good looking you are on the outside, look at how ugly our hearts are because we're always going after the outward appearance. The application isn't that, you know, aren't all of us kind of like David? Like we have good hearts on the inside and that's what people should really focus on. So dating application here, look for the heart, not the outward appearance. That is true. But the problem we're confronted here is that we're people that are always looking for the outward appearance. And so the kings we always choose are always Saul's and never David's. So maybe for you this morning, it's not a literal king that you're going after, but you're looking for something glittery. Maybe a new car or a promotion at work or a title change in your job. Maybe you're looking for the best parent of the decade award with your other preschool moms. You're looking for something that's glittery. You're looking for something that's impressive. And when you and I always focus on the outward appearances, we miss the king that God has placed in front of us with the right heart, a gentle and lowly heart. Heart. The same can be true for us as a church, right? Sometimes churches can place so much confidence in the outward appearance, the glitz and the glam, making things look impressive instead of focusing on the word and presenting a Messiah who has a great heart for you and for his people. We should be reminded in this chapter as a local church not to focus on the externals, but to focus on the internals. And maybe if you're a non-Christian here this morning and and you're saying, to be honest with you, I am kind of bored by Jesus. This carpenter from the first century just doesn't really do something for me. He's not interesting to me. And I would say to you, if you're looking at the externals, you're right. If you're looking at this random carpenter from Nazareth in the first century, It's not going to be a lot impressive to see. But my question for you this morning is, have you looked at Jesus' heart? Have you taken the opportunity to read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of Jesus' life, and look at a man like no other? Would you, this morning, make a decision to, to read one of those? Maybe you start with John and give you an opportunity to stare into the heart of Jesus. God picks kings based on the heart, not the appearance, and so should we. The first part, a surprising choice. The second part, a surprising path. Look with me at verses 14 through 23. So David is anointed in verse 13, and we don't know what happens. It would seem that he goes back to keeping the sheep. Like, I'm king now. All right, I guess I'll go back to the sheep pen. That's like, right, if you were writing 1 Samuel, that's not how you would have written it. I was writing 1 Samuel, the Spirit of God descends upon David, and then right then he's going up to Saul, and he's going to pull like a Gandalf, like, you shall not pass, and I dethrone you as king. Had to make a Lord of the Rings reference in there. I had it as my introduction, and I cut it, and it pained me, so there you go. Um, You know, some, some kind of dramatic, quick ascent to the throne. But that's not at all how this story goes. How you and I would have written the story of David, quickly becoming king, the Lord rushing on him, and then him kind of dethroning Saul isn't what happens. It seems like he goes back to the field, and then the verse after the Spirit rushes on David, verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord departs from Saul, and a spirit is sent to torment him. And so Saul's advisors say, we need someone from the marching band to come and help us. It's not in the English Standard Version, but it's, you know, someone skillful playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit of God is upon you, he will play it and be well. We need someone from the orchestra. We need someone from the band to come and be able to play before King Saul so that when this harmful spirit comes, it will depart from him. So think about the irony of this. The Spirit of the Lord rushes upon David. He probably goes back into the field with the sheep. The Spirit of the God departs from Saul, and he's given an evil spirit to torment him in judgment for how he's rejected the Lord. 
And then David, the newly anointed king, is chosen to come be the harp player to help the guy whose God's judgment is upon not feel so bad. That is not what we have, would have written into the story. That is a surprising path. That's not the path that we would have chosen. And even the guys, as they're talking about David, they don't even remember his name. Look at verse 18. Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, too unimpressive to remember his name. One of those guys with a forgetful face, apparently. The son of Jesse, a Bethlehemite, but look, he's skillful in playing. He's a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. And so they send him to Saul. Jesse sends him with a donkey, with bread and wine and a young goat. And David comes and enters into Saul's service. The Lord's anointed comes to play the harp for the Lord's rejected. And he does it faithfully. And Saul loved him greatly in verse 22. And whenever a harmful spirit would come, from God upon Saul, David would take the lyre and he'd play it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. This is a surprising path for a new king. This again reminds us of Jesus, right? The greater David, who had a very surprising path. We have this amazing birth story in Bethlehem. Right? And the Magi of the East are coming and they're worshiping before Jesus. And we're like, this is great. This is a great way to start. I can't wait to see what else is going to happen next. 30 years of obscurity in Nazareth, a podunk town in the middle of nowhere, training to be a carpenter. Not the path we would have chosen. Gets baptized. The Spirit of God comes down upon him as a dove. The heavens open up. He says, this is my son. We're like, all right, let's do war here. Goes into the desert for 40 days. Does incredible miracles, raises the dead, heals the leper, makes the blind see, the deaf hear, crucified. Not the path we would have chosen. But that was God's path for his anointed. It was a surprising path, but God's path nonetheless. We have to remember that we should not assume that the path that we think is best for our lives is indeed God's path for our lives. Daniel and I started talking about planting this church uh, about 10 years ago. And, and the idea was always going to be around 2018, we were going to plant. And I was going to come in as lead pastor and he was going to come in as discipleship pastor. And then for a variety of reasons, we bumped it a year early. And as Daniel and I were talking, he was saying, you know, I, he's the director of campus outreach at Kennesaw State. And he says, I, I really don't feel released by God yet to leave my ministry at KSU and come to the church. And so we were talking about it and we were processing it. And it was so hard because it was like, wait a minute, th this was the plan. And if you guys know me, type A, this is the plan. We're sticking to the dang plan, right? <laughs> this was the plan. We, we wrote it down. I have the minutes to the meeting from seven years ago. He said, I, I don't feel released by the Lord. So we, we kept talking, but he's doing ministry at KSU, and we're planting the church here in 2017. And then we keep talking, keep talking, and he continues to say, I'm just doing this amazing ministry with these students. I, I don't know how to leave these students. <laughs> and then Campus Outreach decides to restructure the entire North Georgia ministry and shuts every campus down except for Georgia Tech. Talk about the Lord's release. <laughs> so we began to talk, but then we reached another problem. Well, we don't actually have enough money to pay you, so how do we figure this one out? But because Daniel was so fruitful and faithful in raising support for campus outreach, he had some reserves that he had stored up. And because of how things went with, with everything, kind of the strange circumstances, Campus Outreach and Perimeter were gracious and faithful to say, you know what, we'll send all that to you to help him in his new ministry assignment. Furthermore, some of you here this morning are students from KSU 
that are here because of Daniel. You're here because of his investment in your life. And you probably wouldn't have been a part of this church or sitting in these seats if he had left early when I originally wanted him to. Our path that we assume is the path that we should walk on is not always God's path for us. But God's path is always better. God's path is always better. It might be winding. It might be strange. It might be painful. It might be filled with suffering. But just because it's the story that you wouldn't write doesn't mean it's not a better story. That can be said of all things in our lives, right? Your path in life may not be the path that God chooses for you, but his choice is better. Your path in your career may not be the path that God chooses for you, but God's choice is better. Our path for our church and our plan for this church may not be the path that God has for us, but his path is better. Your path for your kids may not be the path that God has for them, but his path is better. 1 Samuel 16 is filled with surprises. But we're reminded that God picks his king based on the heart, not the appearance, and so should we. A surprising choice and a surprising path. We really do have two options in life. We can go after the glittering goblet, that's the fake grail, or we can go after the real grail. Israel already had the glittering goblet in chapters 13 through 15 in the life of Saul, and it didn't end well. It ended with Saul preventing them from even having any honey after a victory. And we're about to get a taste for the carpenter's cup. We're about to get a taste for David in chapter 17 when he defeats Goliath. The question for me and for you is, who do you want as your king? You want someone for your king that tells you you can't eat the honey? Or do you want someone that goes and defeats Goliath? Because those are our two options. We should look at the heart of our kings, not their appearance in our choice. In the one place that Jesus describes his heart is Matthew 11. He says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My friends, would you see the greater David? Would you see this great shepherd who invites you to come and to look at his heart, a heart that is gentle and lowly, a heart where you can find rest, where his yoke is easy and his burden is light? That's the kind of king worth following. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this incredible story about David's anointing. We confess that we are often like Israel and even like Samuel, thinking the outside appearance is what matters, but neglecting the heart. Oh, Father, would you give us grace this week to examine the hearts of our kings that we've placed our hope in? And would you give us grace to look to the heart of Jesus, who's gentle and lowly? Oh, Lord, would you attract us to him so that the things of this world would grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.